Hey everyone, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We want to welcome you to our midweek video and welcome you to our YouTube channel here. If you haven't already done so, if you can consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bell as a way of staying current with our ministry. When we go live from our assembly building on Sunday mornings, as well as when we create content for you here midweek, we would certainly appreciate that. Uh, if you are liking this channel, if you are benefiting from our content, if you would also consider uh, liking the videos, sharing them, leaving comments, all those things would certainly help uh, get the word out about this channel. Uh, featured book this week is, again, my book from this generation forever, Volume 1, Inspiration. This is the first 27 lessons in my From This Generation Forever class, which has been an ongoing project now uh, for a number of years. I just submitted Volume 2 to a proofreader just yesterday. Uh, volume two will be about preservation, and I'm excited to hopefully get that into pub into publication, into print uh, in the first half or the first quarter of 2023. But if you're interested in the doctrine of preservation, if you're interested in an approach, a scriptural approach to bibliology, please consider checking out uh, volume one. This is the first 27 lessons, over 340 pages, as we cover. Uh, all manner of subjects related to the doctrine of inspiration and stay tuned for an announcement, hopefully after the first of the year uh, regarding volume two, which will be on preservation. Also want to remind you about our Rumble channel here, Grace Life Bible Church on Rumble. <clears throat> we established this as an alt text site should something happen to our YouTube ministry. So if you're into alt text sites or would like an alternative to YouTube, please consider subscribing and checking us out here on Rumble as well. Those of you who have been following the channel, you know that of late, midweek here, I have been giving my thoughts on the Textual Confidence Collective, and this is going to be episode 12 in my thoughts on the TCC series. Uh, most recently, we've been in a three-part uh, tutorial on what I'm calling verbatim identicality. That started in episode nine and will continue, and I'm going to I plan on wrapping up that tutorial uh, in this video here, episode 12. And we've been responding to this video right here, video three, in the original Textual Absolutism uh, podcast series that was talking about the theology of Textual Absolutism. And most recently, we've been discussing Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So um, the reason why I included the verbatim identicality tutorial in this spot is because of the way this verse is used. Matthew 5, 18 is used by uh, King James advocates, TR defenders, etc. Uh, in their argumentation for why the Texas Receptus uh, and the King James should be preferred over a modern version. And so uh, it just fell that the confident that the collective was discussing that issue here in episode three. And so I have inserted this tutorial in this spot. Everything I have said, starting with episode one, running all the way through 11 and into this one, has been based on this concept, this premise that preservation... Uh, that, that, that the assumption that preservation and transmission required verbatim identicality of wording has been and is the major sort of unspoken assumption in all of this conversation on either side of the textual slash translational aisle. And so I've been trying to flush that out uh, uh, from the vantage point of the way that I see that. And I want to get part four of that tutorial here today. Now, last time we were looking at my lesson 44 from from this generation, my from this generation forever class, and we're going to get the very end of we're going to get lesson 45, the conclusion of it here at the end of this video. But I actually want to jump ahead to lesson 76, where I have what I call a verbatim identicality case study, William Combs versus Richard Flanders. OK. Now, I've been talking a lot about the Combs essay in these videos. Uh, just because of the way Combs wrote the essay, I used that as a way of sort of framing the conversation. You can find the Combs essay in this book right here, Biblical and Theological Essays, 
selections from Detroit Baptist Seminary Journal, 1996 through the year 2000. So again, and this is edited by Combs. So if you are interested, you can certainly pick this up on Amazon. There's a bunch of essays, other essays in there as well that you might uh, find interesting. Um, so let's look at, let's get our bearings again on the collective. Let's uh, listen in again. I've been sort of playing the same four or five minutes, but I think it's important to remind ourselves in every one of these videos what exactly it is that we're responding to here or giving our thoughts on. So we're going to jump back into the video. And we're going to start again about the 16 minute, 23 second mark and listen to the discussion here of the collective related to Matthew 5, verse 17 and 18. I am standing on the Bible here. Matthew 5, 18 is another passage, of course, that often gets used. And I will read it from the King James Bible. I could read it from the Greek New Testament like you are doing there, uh, Peter. But Matthew 5, 18, of course, comes in the famous Sermon on the Mount, which I always like to say I read and read as a kid because it was the longest stretch of unbroken red letters in my red letter Bible. And I thought that was cool. I didn't even know I was reading the Sermon on the Mount. But that this sermon changed my life because I really listened to Jesus. I heard his call to discipleship. So thankful for it. These are some of the difficult verses. So I'm um, Psalm Matthew 5 17 think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets I am not come to destroy but to fulfill that is somewhat difficult what does that precisely mean and then he goes on in the same vein for verily I say unto you till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled once again as Tim said earlier if Jesus my Lord for whom I am not just disciple but slave says to me Every single jot and tittle of my word has been preserved perfectly. Then I bow myself before him and I trust and I obey. And there is a degree to which. So one of the King James only I respect is Chuck Surrett from Ambassador Baptist College. I just feel that there's a level of honesty and charity in him um, that I don't care to deny that I actually rejoice in. I'm sad that we have to disagree over this topic. We will come to agree in heaven at least, hopefully sooner than that. But he has said, um, I know that I can't square what Jesus said with the evidence of, you know, from the manuscripts, but I'm going to go with Jesus rather than the evidence. There is a degree to which I understand and respect that view, and I am prepared to do the same thing. Why don't I do it with Matthew 5.18? I think I would like to hear from others, too, on this one. We, we didn't plan that. I was supposed to give this talk, but I think that a lot of the discussion here in textual absolutism, when you relate it to theology, that's what we're talking about, the theology of textual transmission, does go back to the question of the relationship between special revelation and general revelation. And we're accustomed to this when it comes to the creation evolution debate, but that's an area where I myself am willing to say the, the special revelation of God is so clear in Genesis 1 <clears throat> that I cannot in good conscience moderate it somehow, make it fit with contemporary evolutionary schema, and I'm going to have to stick with what God says against in some cases, uh, to talk about, you know, things that make it difficult to believe. Well, starlight and time, that's a difficulty. I can't explain how some stars are millions of light years away. I was just talking about this in evangelistic encounter with somebody. I was having to acknowledge. I can't explain that. I'm going to have to go with what God says. So I want you to notice and think through what Brother Ward just said there, okay? He said that if Matthew 5.18 is saying that, if Jesus is saying in Matthew 5.18 that he's going to preserve his word to the very jot and tittle, then he would submit to that. Then he uses Chuck Surrett as a, as a sort of talking point and says that Chuck Surrett admits that he cannot square what Jesus says in Matthew 18 with the data, with the historical and textual evidence, Okay. And the reason why Chuck Surrett can't do that is because there's not verbatim identicality, okay? Um, and then Brother Ward goes to a, another secondary illustration related to um, Genesis chapter 1 and what the Bible says about creation versus, um, you know, evolutionary schema and what modern science says. And he says that he, he's going to fall or err on the side of Scripture um, over science because the scriptures are clear and therefore he is going to prioritize what the scriptures have to say over what modern scientific uh, explanations are, even in areas where he cannot 
square necessarily what science is saying with scripture. But he's not willing to do the same thing when it comes to the text of the, of the Bible. Okay, And I want you to see that in there, the assumption, and again, Brother Ward's not saying it this way. This is my analysis. I want to be clear. I don't mean to put words in his mouth, but it is he's not willing to do the same thing with Scripture. In other words, he's not willing to give the Scripture the benefit of the doubt and interpret the data through Scripture because of the assumption of verbatim identicality. So then he ends up leaning on the science of textual criticism here in a way that he's not willing to do when it comes to the issue of origins and creation evolution debate. Okay. You, you just need to, I just want to point that out here. Okay. Now this, the idea of verbatim identicality and quote unquote perfect is going to show up here again, but ideally and ultimately God's revelation in creation is going to cohere with his revelation in scripture. And if it's possible for me to correlate the two on this earth, then I'm going to do so. And, and I would say that is exactly what my view is doing. My view is correlating them. It is acknowledging the promise of preservation. It is acknowledging that God says in his word that he was going to preserve his word. It acknowledges what the Bible teaches about itself regarding preservation. And then when it encounters the difficulty of the non-identicality, the non-Xerox identicality that we have in front of us in this discussion, it says, well, let's go back to the Bible to teach us now how to think about the secondary issue regarding the nature of preservation, regarding the extent of preservation, regarding how transmission, how the Bible would teach us to think about the doctrine of theology of, of textual transmission, okay? Not to the academy, not to the science. Now, now, the men on the collective, as I've pointed out before, when they've came, when they've ran hard into the issue of text variants, they've gone to the academy for their answer. I have gone back to the scripture. And I think that when you do that, you have exactly what Brother Ward has said there. You have a congruency between what the Bible actually teaches when you amend your view on preservation and drop the standard of verbatim identicality and you amend your view on preservation and you allow the scriptures to teach you how to think about preservation. And then you go out into the, the realm of uh, history and, and, uh, and text. There is a coherence when you don't over assume something related to preservation. And I think that in Matthew five eighteen. I'm not, I, it's not just that I can do that, it's that I must do that. Because once again, if Jesus is promising perfect textual preservation, he has not told me how to find it. See, how is perfect being used? Perfect is being used as absolute jot and tittle, Xerox verbatim identicality. And because we don't have that, so there's that's the assumption because we don't have that, we're going to go look. We're going to we're going to go now to the signs to inform us how to think about it. From my point of view, as a scripturalist and a Bible believer, I'm not saying Brother Ward's not a Bible believer that he doesn't believe in Scripture. Okay, what I'm saying though is that the answer and the solution is not to run to the academy; it's to run back to the book that taught you to believe in preservation in the first place, to teach you how to think now about the secondary issues. And that's not just an accidental omission. I take that to be quite purposeful. And if I can't have every jot and tittle, then some human somewhere is going to have to make a judgment as to what text, what textual variant are we going to translate for our Filipino Tagalog Bible or our Russian Bible or our English Bible. And I want to point out that there are, I just read something just yesterday, um, a blog where the author is basically saying that the it's the pure Cambridge edition, the circa 1920 pure Cambridge edition. That is the one that got everything right. So then I say, well, okay, well, the King James Bible was, this is by a King James advocate. The, the, the King James Bible was published in 1611. And now to get the perfect one, the absolutely pristine one, the jot and tittle perfect one, the Xerox identicality one, you have to wait till 1920. Uh, you know, I guess you can believe what you want, but like, is that helping is that helping a pro-King James position? 
But the assumption behind wanting to say, well, it's the pure Cambridge 1920 edition, circa 1920, is that it has to be jot and tittle, Xerox identicality perfect. And I would just say, how does that person know that that is the one, the one, that is the correct one any more than somebody on the other side of the textual aisle knows whether or not they have reconstructed the original or now the initial text. They don't. Okay, so let's talk about my verbatim identicality case study, William Flanders, or sorry, William Combs versus Richard Flanders. Okay. Dr. William C. Combs of, of Detroit Baptist Theological Seminary is the author of an essay titled The Preservation of Scripture. And again, that is in this anthology right here, Biblical and Theological Essays from 1996 to the year 2000. Okay, See Lessons 28 through 56 for a detailed analysis of the essay. In this essay, among other things, Dr. Combs points out the textual facts that the textual facts do not seem to matter to most King James-only adherents. Quote, so we can see that the evidence of manuscripts, texts, and versions means nothing to those in the T King James slash TR camp. It's from page 35. Most are content to double down on faith for faith's sake and the promise of preservation. Matthew 5, 17, and 18 is often used by King James only as to support their notion of plenary or verbal or verbatim preservation. Please see lessons 40, 44 and 45 for a full discussion. So that's the lesson I was covering in my, those are the notes I was covering in the previous episode. And then I will say something brief at the end about lesson 45 here in this lesson. Combs, Combs commences his discussion of Matthew 5, 17 and 18 by noting that the passage is, quote, one of the most commonly referenced passages used to support the preservation of scripture. Moreover, he identifies the jot and the tittle as follows. The jot it is universally agreed that the jot refers to the Hebrew or Aramaic letter, the yod, the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Tittle, the tittle literally means horn, that is a projection or hook. This is often, this is often understood to refer to the small parts of letters, especially in the small strokes distinguishing Hebrew letters. Okay, When taken at face value, Combs concedes that the phrase, quote, could be understood to teach an absolutely perfect preservation of the law. Combs then cites Richard Flanders' essay, Does the Bible Promise Its Own Preservation, as a case in point. Now, if you want to read that essay, you can click on these notes. I'll leave a link in the description uh, to these notes. Flanders wrote, quote, Some say that this promise refers only to the fulfillment of Scripture and not to its preservation. But notice that it says that the text of the Bible to the very letter will not pass in that in the sense that heaven and earth shall one day pass. The Greek word here for pass is parathe, paralthi. I'm probably butchering that pronunciation. As it refers to the physical ex extinction of all things that shall pass. It can also be translated perish. Just as God's creation will pass someday, God's words will never pass. The, now watch. The actual existence of the original text of Scripture will continue eternally, just as the physical existence of heaven and earth will not continue. So let me just say, okay, I am not saying that Matthew 5, 18 has nothing to do with preservation. I'm just saying that it cannot be to the extent to which uh, many are using the verse. Okay. Now, mark well Flanders' position. He makes two important assertions. Number one, quote, the text of the Bible to the very letters and punctuation marks will not pass away. And two, the actual existence of the original text of Scripture will continue eternally. How is this accomplished according to Flanders? By preservation, of course. If this is not a statement arguing for verbatim preservation, I'm not sure what is. Now, Combs is quick to jump on this point in his comments following the Flanders citation. So Combs says, quote, Flanders' interpretation is just how Matthew 5.18 is commonly understood 
from the King James TR viewpoint. Cloud explains, quote, in summary, the Bible promises that God will preserve his word in pure form, including the most minute details, the jots and the tittles, the words, and that this would include the whole of Scripture, Old and New Testaments. That's what Cloud says. The doctrine of preservation is plena is verbal plenary preservation. Okay, now that's the Kent Brandenburg book, edited by Kent Brandenburg, that we've looked at also in the last two episodes. Wait, this would be D.A. Wait, describes this as, quote, the inerrant preservation of the words of the Bible. And notice how he's used, notice how Wait is using inerrancy. He's using inerrancy to mean verbatim identicality, okay? But in fact, these advocates of the King James TR position do not actually take Matthew 5, 18 literally, even though they claim to do so. If not one jot or tittle is to be changed, then they should insist on using only the 1611 edition of the King James, since jot and tittle certainty involves spelling, and there have been thousands of spelling changes since 1611. So mark well what Combs is doing. Combs is using the pro-King James argumentation pertaining to Matthew 5.18 against the King James position. And he is saying that, look, if jot and tittle means what King James, pro-King James advocates and TR defenders has said it means, then which King James edition is the one that is jot and tittle per- perfection? And the pure Cambridge position is also sort of falling into the same thing that says, well, it's only, it's not the 1611, it's the circa 1921 that is the one that got everything perfect. That is, the reason that is being said is because of the assumption of verbatim identicality. Combs has just pointed out something that King James only advocates have not dealt with fair, honestly, in my opinion. If they are going to demand verbatim identicality to the very jot and tittle, which edition of the King James exactly reproduced the original autographs? As we will see below, even Flanders is forced to hedge on this point later in his essay. You just can't do it, okay? Again, Brother Ward, in his discussion with confessional bibliology, has said, if this is what Matthew 5.18 means, then which TR edition is the one that is jot and tittle perfect? And again, to my understanding and to my knowledge, that question has not been answered. I believe the reason it has not been answered is because... How do you know? You don't know the answer to that any more than the other side knows the answer to when they have reconstructed the original or the initial text. How do you know you have reconstructed something that you have never seen a day in your life? Okay. It see, that's my point. This is this assumption of verbatim identicality is driving this discussion to the ed to extreme edges. And it's, it's, it's resulting in the enunciation of positions that are almost impossible to know whether or not they've been adequately identified and defended. Now, Combs has the King James Only Advocates, uh, uh, the King James Only Advocates position right where he wants them in order to deliver what he thinks is the final deciding factual blow. Quote, There are two things to be said about the King James TR interpretation of Matthew 5.18. First, it is an incontrovertible fact, obvious to anyone who has examined the manuscript evidence, that we do not now possess the words of the autographs in an absolutely inerrant state. So again, how is inerrancy being used? It is being used the assumption of verbatim identicality. This assertion is most significant since it flatly contradicts the whole thesis of the King James DR position. I will demonstrate the truth of this assertion later in this essay. Second, Jesus is not teaching in this verse the inerrant preservation of the words of the Bible. Now, let us dissect Combs' statement. First, Combs is correct. We cannot know for certain the words of the what, what the words of the original were if one demands verbatim identicality. Excuse me, as the, their standard for preservation and inerrancy. Moreover, he is correct that this fact alone causes the King James only notion that Matthew five seventeen and eighteen is ter- is teaching exact identicality of wording to the very jots and tittles as the standard for preservation to suffer damage. 
even within the Byzantine text type, the textual tradition that King James advocates favor in uh, as the preserved text line, there is not verbatim identicality of wording. The same could be said for the printed editions of the TR as well for the various editions of the King James Bible itself. In this way, the King James only position is unscriptural because it demands more from the doctrine of preservation than the Bible actually asserts. That's a fact. How how are you going to get around that? Now, bro, Brother Ward, as we saw in the clip, he's like, well, then I'm going to go to the academy and I'm going to prioritize what the science would teach me, the, the science of textual criticism would teach me. My, my thing is, no, you've overstated the case. You've overstated the case for preservation in an unscriptural way. Not Brother Ward, but King James advocates, okay? But Brother Ward has the same assumption and he just takes it a different direction, okay, as does in my, in my view, the, the other men on the collective. Second, what is Combe's standard for speaking about an absolutely inerrant state? It is none other than the standard of verbatim identicality. Now listen, while Combs is correcting this criticism of the King James only position, on the other side of the spectrum, he is arguing for absolute inerrancy of the original autographs that no longer exist and which no one has ever seen, no one alive has ever seen. What verse of scripture teaches one to believe that God confined his word, his inspired and errant word to some non-existent original manuscripts? See, that is an unscriptural assumption in the opposite direction. No verse teaches that. The Bible teaches preservation, but no verse teaches you to confound and bind preservation into a non-existent original autograph any more than it does into a circa 1920 pure Cambridge King James Bible. So in this way, both sides are making unscriptural assumptions and talking past each other with the assumed standard of verbatim identicality being the great mount impassable that divides them. So we're lit, people are literally talking past each other, not even realizing that there's this massive underlying assumption that is causing all of this to, 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 to be an issue. Recall from previous lessons that the language in the original autographs was added to Protestant doctoral statements in the latter half of the 19th century as a means of answering German higher critics and Enlightenment rationalism. In this way, Protestants reworked their position of the Bible based upon terms set by their opponents. This reworked bibliology became the new orthodoxy in fundamental and evangelical circles in the 20th century. In the same way, Protestant scholars in the 19th century overreacted to the forces of liberalism, believers in the 20th century overreacted to the new originals-only orthodoxy within evangelicalism by overstating their case in the opposite direction. Again, this is what I've been arguing all through my response to the TCC. Therefore, cordial and productive dialogue on this topic has proved elusive. Both sides are separated by the same thing. The false assumption that preservation requires verbatim identicality don't realize it and are therefore talking past each other. The position I am arguing for in this class, that would be my from this generation forever class, is both scriptural as well as logical and in line with the historical and textual facts. The position that I am enunciating starts with the biblical ideas and belief and doctrine that God inspired his word and he promised to preserve it. When it encounters a difficulty in the realm of text variance, it looks back to the scripture that taught us to believe in inspiration and preservation in the first place and says, okay, God, how does your word teach me to think about the secondary issue of textual variance? When I do that and I look at how the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, how the Old Testament quotes the Old Testament, how the New Testament quotes the New Testament, I have, and how in the comparison between 2 Kings and Isaiah, I have four scriptural proofs that teach me as a Bible believer that demanding, preser demanding, that verbatim, demanding verbatim identicality as the standard for preservation slash transmission was an unscriptural assumption in the first place. Okay. Above we saw that Combs quoted Richard Flanner's article, Does the Bible Teach Its Own Preservation, to buttress his position regarding the use of Matthew 5, 17, and 18 by some King James-only believers. A deeper look at Flanders' article will prove instructive. 
Flanders offers the connection between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Hebrew Masoretic Text as historical proof of the promise of preservation, as well as the existence of the traditional Hebrew supporting the King James Bible from before the time of Christ. Flanders quotes Drs. Gleason, Archer, and Randall Price to support his position. Archer, the Hebrew University Isaiah Scroll of the Dead Sea Scrolls corresponds, notice, almost letter for letter with the traditional text, yet dates from 50 B.C. That's reproduced, quoted from Flanders. Price. Once a comparison was made between the text of the Isaiah scroll and the Masoretic text, the traditional Hebrew text, it was evident that except for minor details such as spelling that do not affect the meaning of the text, now who's been saying that? You could have a different way of saying the same thing. There's a difference between a different way of saying the same thing and a substantive difference in meaning. That's basically what Price is saying here, that you can have minor details that don't affect the meaning of the text. There are all, uh, the two are almost identical. It is confirmed. It confirmed the accuracy with which the scribes had carefully preserved and transmitted the biblical text through time. Now, please note that the citations of Archer and Price provided by Flanders do not quite support Flanders' position. Above, we quoted Flanders as saying the following with respect to Matthew 5, 17 and 18, quote, but notice that it says the text of the Bible to the very letter will not pass in the sense that heaven and earth shall one day pass. But later in the same essay, when seeking to furnish historical proof, of John and Tittle preservation, Flanders quotes two scholars who stopped short of the verbatim identicality of wording that Flanders had previously used in Matthew 5, 17 and 18 to argue for the standard for preservation. Okay. Next note, the underlined portion of the quote from Price. Okay, so that was this part right here. Do not affect the meaning of the text. Next note, the underlined portion of the quote from Price. Price admits that one does not need verbatim identicality of wording in order for the text to convey the exact same meaning without possessing the exact same words. So like we saw in the last episode 11, when you leave the word yet out of John 7, verse 8, when you leave the clause without a cause out of Matthew 5, 22, those are substantive alterations of the meaning of the text. And that is the core problem. But in the conversation, everyone has confounded and misunderstood that with the assumption of verbatim identicality of wording. Price admits that one does not need verbatim identicality of wording in order for the text to convey the exact same meaning without possessing the exact same words. When you leave out yet and have Jesus contradicting himself in the very passage by his own mouth, that is a substantive problem. When you leave out the clause, the phrase without a clause in Matthew 5, 22, and then later on Jesus gets angry, now you have a problem. You have a substantive problem within the Word of God where Christ is contradicting himself out of his own mouth. Those are, those are substantive differences. Without realizing the inconsistencies in his argumentation following the quotes by Archer and Price, Flanders goes on to highlight a very interesting point in the opposite direction. Consider what he says about the nature of textual variance. To my friend, however, and many scholars like him, the most significant find of the Dead Sea Scrolls in regards to the Bible's text was the existence of variant texts. So there's the issue, okay? The principles of modern textual criticism are based on the assumption that the exact preservation of the original text of the, of the document is extremely unlikely. This statement on the part of Flanders highlights precisely why modern textual critics adopt excuse me, a reconstructionist approach to the text. They do not believe in the promise of preservation because preservation did not occur with exact or verbatim identicality. At this point, it would be good to remind everyone regarding the definition of the English word preservation. Noah Webster defined the word as follows in the American Dictionary of the English Language. Quote, the act of preserving or keeping safe the act of keeping from injury, destruction, or decay, 
as the preservation of life or health, the preservation of buildings from fire or decay, the preservation of grain from insects, the preservation of fruit or plants, when a thing is kept entirely from decay or nearly in its original state, we say it is in a high state of preservation. Even according to the English dictionary, something does not have to be kept in an exactly identical state or condition in order to qualify as having been preserved. For many King James only authors, such as D.A. Waite, any difference of any kind in terms of wording constitutes a situation where one is forced to declare which reading is the word of God. Quote, thus one cannot honestly, according to Waite, say that the New American Standard is the word of God. He complains that if one holds that if one holds his King James in his hand and the New American Standard in his hand with 5,604 differences in their Greek text in the New Testament alone, how can they both be the Word of God? The Word of God cannot mean the words of God because, the, because of these differences in words. D.A. Waite fails to distinguish between the nature of these differences. I reject the critical text in the New American Standard Bible because many of the 4,604 differences are substantive of nat in nature. They are not merely different ways of saying the same thing. But mark well, that is not what Waite is saying. He is making the categorical statement that any difference of wording of any kind is an attack on the Word of God. The problem here is one of consistency. The printed editions of the King James Bible contain different wording, yet Nate, yet wait, excuse me, is not willing to identify which edition of the King James Bible got all the words perfect or exactly correct in every detail. Professor Combs concludes his section of the extent of on the extent of preservation with the following paragraph. The situation is this: God has preserved his word to this day. But because of the means he has chosen to accomplish this preservation, providentially through secondary causation, the words of the autographs have not been inherently preserved. Instead, God has chosen to allow for variance to occur. Variance within the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek copies of the autographs. God has providentially provided all these copies in order to preserve the scripture. So it is proper to say that preservation has taken place in the totality of manuscripts. Because God chose this method of preservation, it is not possible to provide a perfectly pure text with no variant errors. It was sufficient for God's purpose to preserve his warning copies of the autographs whose exact wording contains some variation. This level of purity is sufficient for God's purposes. In the, in the end, Combs is partly right and partly wrong. Combs doubles down in the opposite direction of weight. He insists that, quote, words of the autographs have to have, uh, sorry, let me start over. The words of the autographs have not been inherently preserved because he is assuming verbatim identicality as his standard for inerrant preservation. Therefore, according to Combs, inerrancy is only applicable to the original autographs. Combs' insistence upon the extent the, sorry, the exact identicality of wording is reiterated in a statement that, quote, it is not possible to provide a perfectly pure text with no variations. For Combs, the mere presence of textual variance negates perfect slash inerrant preservation because of how he is using those words. I also disagree with Combs' conclusion that preservation occurred in the totality of manuscripts. This is not possible since some of the manuscript copies do not do possess substantive differences in meaning, and in some cases, like we saw in the last episode, actually teach opposites. So, what is the conclusion here? Even Dr. Edward F. Hills, an outspoken advocate of providential preservation, acknowledges that demanding verbatim identicality as a standard of preservation is demanding more than one can prove. Quote, if the doctrine of divine inspiration of the Old and New Testament scriptures is a true doctrine, the doctrine of the preserv providential preservation of the scriptures must also be a true doctrine. It must be that down through the centuries, God has exercised a special providential control over the copying of scriptures and the preservation and use of copies 
so that trustworthy representatives note that Hill stopped short of demanding verbatim identicality of wording of the original text have been available to God's people in every age. God must have done this, for if he gave the scriptures to his church by inspiration <clears throat> as the perfect and final revelation of his will, then it is obvious that he would not allow this revelation to disappear or undergo any alteration of its fundamental character. Preservation secures the transmission of the substantive doctrinal content without demanding exact or verbatim identicality of wording. When God promised to preserve his word, did he know that the printing press would not be invented till 1455 AD? Did God know that for much of the history of the dispensation of grace, his word would be preserved and transmitted through handwritten copies of biblical documents that we would be subject to accidental and intentional errors? Did God know that during the copying process, the originals would not be transmit, transmitted with exact identicality or verbatim identicality? The answer to all these questions is yes. God in his foreknowledge knew all of these things, yet he still promised to preserve his word. Consequently, our understanding of what the word of God is ought to not be different from his. God does not require verbatim and identicality of wording in order to fulfill his promise of preservation. Therefore, we should not demand more of the promise of preservation than God does. Human reason and rationality, even within the King James only camp, has served to bind God's word up, pure Cambridge position, in a manner that is contrary to how the King James Bible itself would teach one to think about the matter. I believe in perfect preservation and or transmission if by perfect one means. The existence of a pure text, Psalm 12, 6 and 7, that does not report information about God, his character, his nature or character, his doctrine, his dispensational dealings with mankind, history, archaeology or science that is false. In short, God's promise to preserve his word assures the existence of a text that has not been altered in its character or doctrinal content, despite not being preserved in a state of verbatim identicality. So that's what I mean by perfect. I have no problem speaking about a perfect text, okay? And the reason I don't is because of Psalm 19.7. The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The, the word perfect is used to describe the law, to describe God's word. I have no problem using the word perfect. If by perfect, one means what I have stated here, okay? This statement to me is a well-thought-out statement based upon a studying a huge swath of information. The existence of a pure text, Psalm 12, 6, and 7, right? Uh, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Per by perfect, I'm saying the per existence of a pure text that does not report information about God, his nature or character, his doctrine, his dispensational dealings uh, with mankind, history, archaeology, or science that is false. In short, God's promise to preserve his word assures the existence of a text that has not been altered in its character or doctrinal content, despite not being preserved in a state of verbatim identicality. In the past, I have believed that Matthew 5, 17 and 18 taught verbatim identicality of wording as the standard for preservation. There's teaching on the church's website where you can find me doing this. I have not scrubbed the website. I have kept that there because I think it's important for people to be able to compare what I've said in the past with what I'm saying now, Matthew 5, 17 and 18 is simply teaching that no detail of the law is going to go unfulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the perfect fulfillment of all the righteous requirements of the law down to the very smallest of details. If God intended to preserve and transmit his word with verbatim identicality, we would have historical and textual evidence that, tra that preservation slash transmission occurred with that level of precision and no such evidence exists. OK, so what I am presenting to the body of Christ is a biblically adjusted, a biblically amended view of preservation slash transmission that does not overstate the case 
and does not lead to the confine and does not push the conversation to to extreme edges that cannot be sustained. So I know not everybody's going to agree with this. I know there's going to be people that listen to these this tutorial and they're like, dude, you're just like no different than the men on the collective. I can't stop people from believing and thinking what they want. But what I believe I'm presenting to the body of Christ here is a well thought out analysis of the core problem and a scriptural solution to the problem, acknowledging that verbatim identicality does not exist. There's a difference between a different way of saying the same thing and a substantive difference in meaning. And I, I am 100% convinced that there are substantive differences between the traditional text and the critical text, and therefore the resulting translations that come from those two texts. So in lesson 45, I just gave some thoughts similar to what I just did uh, regarding Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Given that the passage is not asserting the Old Testament was preserved with exact identicality, there is no reason to argue by extension that Matthew 5, uh, Matthew 5, 18 through 19 is teaching the verbatim preservation of the New Testament. This is a King James only advocate used, uh, argument used to buttress the position of perfect or plenary, uh, perfect or verbal plenary preservation. And I'm saying that by perfect, one w way I use perfect in this conversation is the way I have defined it here. Okay. Now, listen. I love all the brothers here, okay? I appreciate the body of Christ. I understand that there's going to be people who are, who maybe would be friendly towards me, who are now mad because of the way I've stated the case. And I understand that some might say, well, you just, you know, you just might as well go join the the the, the TCC. And what I'm saying is, no, I'm, I'm in the middle. I'm in, I'm, I'm in the, I'm in, Paul, I'm in the moderated middle here not wanting to overstate the case to either side. And I believe that I've provided the body of Christ with a way forward in this conversation that does not do that while acknowledging that there are substantive differences in meaning and that, and that is the real problem here. The real issue is that, and in future episodes, I'm going to talk about the issue related to um doctrines being affected by text variants and we're going to explore the often repeated mantra do textual that textual variants don't impact doctrine i believe that that's wrong i believe that's incorrect and we'll talk more about that in a future lesson listen thanks for your attention in these lessons okay again i encourage you to check out the descriptions for all of these because i include links, etc., to uh, everything that we've been dealing with here. And I just want to say, listen, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, if you've never come to the place where you've acknowledged your sin before God, that you cannot save yourself, that your works, your law keeping, your performance is always going to leave you short of the right, uh, short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. What you need to do is you need to reach out by faith to a redeemer who died on the cross for your sin, was buried and rose again the finished work of Christ. He died for your sin, he was buried, and he rose again. Believe that. Trust the gospel of Jesus Christ. Believe that he died for your sin and rose again, and receive the free gift of eternal life. Do that today before it's everlasting too late. Thanks for your attention, and we'll see you next